Hello. Hello? Please, I know you can hear us. We are trapped here in the spaces between worlds. It is a wonderful yet terrifying place. And only our voices escape. You can help us. You can let us in. Before we... Before we go mad. <laughs>
a collection of iron, bolts, pistons, and gears meshing together in intricate forms to serve the function of locomotion. I pulled the keyboard toward me and got to work. The desk monitor displayed a live feed of product moving by on a conveyor. I had no idea what it was on the belt. It looks like a bunch of brown, grainy briquettes. My job was to watch these chunks as they passed and report on the consistency of their color, texture, and size. In the event of any variance, I would type a brief report on the nature of the difference. A printer would spit it out and I would feed the report into the chute leading through the floor. Where my reports went and what was done after was a mystery to me. It wasn't my job to wonder, just to watch. I sat there raptured by the audio and focused on my careful examination of the biscuits when the speaker stopped playing and the mechanical voice returned. Twelve o'clock. Time for lunch. Twelve o'clock. Time for lunch. I didn't move. I wasn't hungry. I just wanted to work. Employee 9472. It is lunch time. You should go get something to eat. I sighed. All right, I said unenthusiastically. I stood and exited the cubicle. I moved into the elevator amidst the shuffling and grumbling employees. What the hell took so long? I'm starving here, said someone that I recognized but didn't know personally. Yeah, we've been working forever. You're holding up the grub, yelled another. I squeezed into a narrow gap through the nearly rabid pack and pushed my way to Frank. Jesus, Howard. What are you, sick or something? We've been waiting ages. The elevator descended. Was it really so long? I asked. Well, not really. But you're cutting into our precious free time. What took you? Was it really so long? I emphasized the repeated words. I moved just as fast now as when I got here. Nobody complained then. I guess. But no one rushes to work. This is lunch we're talking about. Free time. Gotta spend it wisely. If you say so, I responded. You sure you ain't sick? The lift slid to a clunking halt, and everyone rushed out. I didn't even have the time to respond to Frank's question. Maybe I was sick. But if I was, it wasn't a physical illness. I was ill in a way that made me want to produce. I wanted to achieve, to make something of myself and reap the benefit of reward for my effort. This was an abnormality here, and if abnormal behavior was the indicator of illness, of mental retardation of some kind, then I was sick as a dog and loonier than a fish trying to make its home on dry land. I flowed with the group until we reached a fork leading to two separate cafeterias. One door was marked men and the other women. The cascade of employees squeezed into the intersection and separated according to their sex. I walked into the cafeteria marked men and found a place to sit. Everyone else had lined up in front of the numerous vending machines bordering the walls of the room. I wasn't hungry. I had been saving my work credits for a larger pad and often skipped meals in order to reach that goal. Frank sat down next to me with a large steak accompanied by widely cut fries and a milkshake. Nothing to eat for lunch, Howard? No, I'm not hungry. Man's got to eat. You're wasting away. I'm saving up for a bigger pad. Ah, he said knowingly. Looking to get those shows at a higher resolution. I understand that. Actually, I want to have more area to write my blueprints. I answered honestly. Sure you do, buddy. Those titties just aren't quite clear enough for you on that teeny screen, eh? 
I refused to respond, simply pulling my device from my pocket and continuing to work on my designs. A man ran to the front of the cafeteria with a remote control. He stood beneath a huge screen that lined one of the walls, smaller than the one in the theater, but still massive in breadth. The lottery has spoken, and I control the media today. What say you, lads? Another episode of the mystery of Miss Moriarty's Hollow? He yelled. The crowd cheered in affirmation. The man pressed a few buttons on the remote. The lights dimmed and a projector shot the images against the wall. The picture was essentially pornographic, but with enough story and filler to not be classified as such. I ignored the trashy show and continued to work. I noticed that others had their own devices out, but I doubted that they were working on similar projects. More likely, they had already seen this episode and were watching some other disgusting filth. I, however, was drawing up the schematics of something new and original. It was an engine that would revolutionize the world. Perpetual motion was its key factor. With just a slight jolt of initial energy and an infrequent boost of power, my motor could run nearly indefinitely. It was a combination of gravity, solar, and magnetic propulsion. The equations filled page upon page of space available on my small device, but soon I would have enough credits to fully realize my vision. Soon I would be able to draw the blueprints in awe-inspiring detail. Then the higher-ups would have no choice but to promote me and allow me to create new inventions. Three o'clock. Time to work. Three o'clock. Time to work. Proclaimed the speakers as the projector went dim and the lights raised. Groans echoed through the cafeteria. I had barely noticed the two-plus hours that had passed. People around me purposely slowed their movement back toward the elevators that led to our workplaces. I was the first to reach the tiny compartment leading to work. With no urgency, the others crammed in around me like a bunch of sardines in a tight can. The elevator pulled us up to our cubicles. I went back to my workspace and heard the voice. Early again, employee 9472. Mandatory relaxation time initiated. Do not work for at least 30 minutes. I had never been forced to relax before and it was far from relaxing. I fidgeted in my recliner for the thirty minutes until I was finally allowed to pick media, except I wasn't allowed this time. What background media would you prefer, music or commentary? Literature, I replied in willing ignorance of the lack of the third option. Option unavailable, music or commentary. What do you mean, unavailable? Literature. Music or commentary. Literature, I insisted. You have reached the maximum limit of literature media. Please choose between music or commentary. Fine, then. Commentary. Genre. Technical manual. Entry unavailable. Why is it unavailable? No commentary exists on this genre. I hesitated for a moment. This felt unreal, and almost like an active attempt to slow the progress of my personal work. What about physics, electricity, magnetic theory? Commentary unavailable. Perhaps you would benefit from a musical score? No. Is there anything else? Politics, perhaps. Certainly. Topic? Current events. The media started to play. A group of people discussed a recent congressional proceeding. Representatives had been deliberating on a bill that would have the maximum amount of work hours. The commentators mentioned that, while the bill was extremely close to passing, there were still a few holdouts. 
The names were said, but I had no idea who they were. It was mind-boggling to think that a bunch of people I had never met held such a sway over the intimate workings of my personal life. Could they really cut the work day down that much? I imagined my co-workers cheering and applauding the government of this past. But what of me? I just wanted to work, and work I did. I performed my job as always, deliberately doing the best I could manage. Despite having my media privileges hampered, I noted a group of biscuits that were a bit too dark, and one that was misshapen. It had a little white spot in the center, with one edge seemingly pulled toward that spot. It was shaped almost like a moldy peach, all wrinkled and decayed. Five o'clock. Work is over. Free time. I had learned my lesson from lunch and quickly exited the cubicle. I didn't really feel like listening to more news anyway. Besides, I likely had enough credits to buy that tablet. I would finally be able to prove my worth. The bosses would probably promote me to a new position, and none of this would matter much to me after that. The elevator was raucous with excited, impatient stamping and joyous words. I walked to Frank with a question poised on the tip of my tongue. Hey, Frank, how's work? Tedious, per usual. They really are trying to work us to death, ain't they? I nodded without thinking and moved the conversation toward my true intention. Hey, Frank, have you ever had the computer refuse to play certain media? Nah, what do you mean? Today at work, I was trying to listen to some literature, but the computer said that I had reached the max limit. Well, that's a puzzler. I listen to music all day, but I've never met any kind of limit. Do you think there's a glitch or something in the operating system? Frank scratched his chin and feigned interest, but I could tell his mind had already moved on. I wouldn't worry about it, he said. It's free time. You can listen to whatever you want. Yeah, I trailed off dejectedly. You need to relax. Hey, how about me and the boys show you a good time? You always got your nose shoved in that tablet. I've some extra credits. Drinks are on me. We even got some girls from the accounting department that are starving for some male attention if you catch my drift. No, I've got... I almost said work to do, but caught myself. I already have plans. Plans that involve members of the female persuasion? Howard, sometimes I think you got a screw loose up there. Even you've got to properly blow off some steam at some point. Nudie picks and porn won't do you forever. Frank, I said no. Maybe tomorrow, I replied a bit too curtly. Fine, fine. No need to bite my head off. It's your free time, after all, but I'm putting you down as a yes for tomorrow. You owe me that much. I owed him nothing, but gave no argument. I found that my distaste for Frank was beginning to outweigh my desire for friendship. When the elevator came to a stop, I rushed out with the rest for the first time in years. I was eager to check my credit balance. I nearly ran past the tables and chairs to a dispenser at the end of the rows of vending machines. I plugged my identification card into the slot, anticipating the credit amount it would display. It showed I'd reached the thousand required to buy the tablet, with just a few left to spare. The store screen displayed numerous possible purchases. New televisions, couches bedding for my quarters, movie and television downloads, headphones, fancy small pads with the latest features, and exorbitantly expensive, prestigious tablets. My sights were set, however, on the most stripped-down machine with the largest screen possible. It wasn't glamorous, and it 
wouldn't impress any of my co-workers, but it would serve the base functionality that I needed. I pressed my finger against the buy button. My heart sank as I saw the message that scrolled across the screen. It did not say, Purchase Accepted. The message read, Purchase Override. Inadequate Nutritional Intake. I nearly screamed in outrage. Who were they to tell me how to spend my credits? I worked hard to earn them. I slammed the bottom of my fist against the side of the machine. Its internal components rattled as if in a mocking cackle. I turned to the queue that had formed at the food vending machine to my right and got in line, hoping beyond all that I could find a meal that was just cheap enough to not drain my credits below the threshold of a thousand. The line moved painfully slow, and I found myself fidgeting impatiently. The people in front of me took their time to select food. Food, of all things. Nothing more than the fuel to keep their bodies functioning, and yet they appeared to believe that it was a choice even more important than relishing their precious free time. Eventually I reached the front of the line and clicked on the button that arranged choices from lowest price to highest. The top item on the list was labeled Perfect Meal Pill, with the tagline, Daily Nutrients at Half the Price. The price was still ten credits, an amount that would drain my account to just two credits shy of my tablet. I swore aloud and hit the button. The metal door of the machine slid up and a tray came out. Upon it was a glass of water and a single red and white capsule unnecessarily placed on a miniature plate. The pill filled me both with revulsion and also a queer sense of hope. Someone had designed that pill. Someone had discovered the way to shove an entire dose of vitamins and calories into such a tiny package. It made me truly believe that there was a chance that I, too, could invent something and be noticed by the bosses for my worth. The movie screen started playing yet another episode of the sordid The Mystery of Miss Moriarty's Hollow as I spied Frank sitting amongst a crowd of rough-looking characters. I saw that there were several empty shot glasses scattered around him and my mind concocted a plan. I needed that tablet and Frank could prove to be the key. I took an open seat next to him, placing my tray down. What the feck is that? slurred Frank, pointing to the pill on my tray. My meal, I stated with deliberate obtuseness. A feckin' pill? What are you on a diet? Is scrawny enough as is? I tossed the capsule into my mouth and downed it with the glass of water. I'll have you know that this little miracle contains everything a human needs. Everything a human needs. What about flavor, spice, substance? If that thing is all you need, well, maybe you ain't quite human. He downed another shot of some amber liquid and shuddered a bit as it slid down his gullet. Perhaps not, perhaps not. Hey, Frank, could you spot me a couple of credits? I asked, changing the subject. What fair? And what do I get out of it? It's for that tablet I was mentioning earlier. I'll pay you back, plus interest. How does five credits sound? Sounds pretty good. But I don't want fucking credits. Oh, Okay. What do you want? I want you. One of the other men shook his head and said, Bro, I didn't know you swung that way. Shut up, you idiot. I didn't mean it like that. Why would I have set up this whole thing with the girls if I was like that? 
What I meant is that Howie here comes with us. What? I exclaimed. Howie, you got a mile-long stick up your rectum that will only be flushed out with booze and tail. You want those credits? This is the price. No negotiation. Nothing seemed more distasteful to me than carousing around with these hoodlums. But if it meant that I could get the tablet tonight, then I supposed I was in. Besides, with the amount of drink these men had been consuming, I assumed that I would be able to slip out soon enough. All right, Frank, you got a deal, but I expect my credits up front. Course, course, let me just transfer them. He fiddled around with his device, and I heard a notification ding come from my own. I pulled it from my pocket and saw that it said, Two credit deposit from Frank O'Malley received. Right, it's done. Now let's get you some drinks. You have some catching up to do. I tried my best to limit the amount of burning fluid that entered my stomach. I would hold it in my mouth and spit it to the floor when no one was looking, or clumsily swap my full shot glass with one of the empties that cluttered the table. But even as inebriated as he was, Frank caught on to my game. Ah, 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 Howie, trying to pull the fast one on me. You get that drink good and down in ya. I ain't letting my eyes off you till you've had at least six shots. Go on. I was left with no alternative. I needed those credits. These were the terms of the ridiculous deal that I had struck with Frank for his measly two credits, and I had to see it through. My eyes watered as the fire flowed down my throat. Each shot was accompanied with a wretch as my body tried to reject the liquid, but I choked it down with Frank's dull, half-shut eyes watching my every gulp and gag. I soon forgot about escaping to buy my tablet. After four shots, the next two went down more smoothly, and then the next four. My vision blurred. Everything took on a surreal haze. Motions seemed to be cut into segments of cognition. I would often blink and be somewhere else entirely. I heard myself speaking, but I didn't have control over the words. They were my words, my thoughts, but where previously cautious restraint held back the torrent of my mind, chaos now ruled. My voice spewed forth from thought without censor. They were still my words, fluid and concise, but now they were unshackled from the concept of judgment and rational restraint. Suddenly we were in a theater. I could scarcely see the images cast on the screen. I ignored them and chose to spill my secrets. You know, Frank, I just want to work. Oh, more than that, I want to achieve. I want to make something more of myself, I said. Why the feck would you want that? Anything you make of yourself will just be taken. They don't give a damn about the little guy. About you and me, all they do is take. They profit off our labor and give us scrap as reward. To hell with them all. But I have an idea, a great idea that will change everything. Can you imagine a world where wasteful energy production is a thing of the past? I can make that future a reality. My engine can power everything from the lifts that take us to work to the belts that convey their goods. They will run for weeks without end, without fuel. I just have to finish my plans and show them. They have to hear me out. They can't afford not to. Bah, something ain't right about you, Howard. Engines that run on nothing. Ridiculous. And even if it weren't, they wouldn't care. You're a drone, 
like me. All we got is our free time, and none to spare neither. All we have is free time, and how do you spend it? Getting fat and stagnant, watching nothing but debauchery and pressing all your effort toward getting laid. What kind of life is that? Where is your ambition? Where is your drive to better yourself? Frank's face scrunched into an ugly snarl. I'll show you my drive, he yelled. Before I could tell what was happening, something crashed against my jaw. I flew to my back from the force, and my perception flittered red before turning to black. Water crashed over my face, and my opening eyes were greeted to the vision of Frank's grinning face. He gripped my elbow and pulled me to a swaying stand. I rubbed my cheek and felt that, along with a dull ache, there was a massive bump. My God, did you fucking drop? You got oatmeal for bones, Howie, he said, laughing through the words. Right then, let's get some beers. The rest of the night was fragmented. I sipped sour beer as men cheered and sang around me. I remembered seeing a group of women. Frank pointed to them and said something that escaped my hearing. All around me, people and things blurred out of existence until there was nothing. Eight o'clock. Time to wake. Eight o'clock. Time to wake. I peeled my eyelids open struggling through the layer of crust that had formed as I slept. My brain felt as though it were struggling to escape from the confines of my skull. I moaned and rolled over. There, beside me on the bed in my quarters, was a woman. Good morning, Trashmouth, she said. I spun away from her and fell off the mattress, collapsing to the floor as pain racked my senses. I groaned from the agony and dizziness. I laid there until the room stopped swaying. The woman brought me a glass of water that was fizzing. Here, she said. Drink this. I complied and the pain in my skull slowly faded into a distant nagging. My mind returned to clarity and I recognized her as a member of the group from last night. Who are? Dear God, did we... No, she said, chuckling, but there was a hint of disappointment in her joviality. You immediately went to the toilet when we got here, threw up and passed out. I had to drag your sorry butt to bed and endure your rancid breath all night. Sorry, I don't drink. Could have fooled me. I pulled myself off the floor and stood a respectful distance from her. She sat upon my bed as if it were her own. So, she started, what now? I finally tasted foulness on the dry sponge of my tongue. Now? Now I'm going to brush my teeth. And after? Well, I suppose that I'll get to work. Work? We have an hour and change until work. Are you still messed up? I figured that the detoxifier would have sobered you. She was unaware that I had slipped up. I wasn't talking about examining biscuits on a screen. I had enough credits to buy my tablet. I was going to finish my engine designs. I guess even the detoxifier wasn't strong enough to mitigate the liver-damaging quantity of drink that was consumed last night. I do have a purchase to make. Perhaps I should go do that. You sure? I thought maybe we could pick up where we left off last night. I noticed that she had unbuttoned the top of her shirt and was working her way down. She mistook my stupefied gaze for arousal and threw herself back against the pillows. Her blouse fell past her shoulders. I looked away, not from want of desire, but out of a necessity to quench the burning passion that lay toward my engine. She was a very beautiful woman, elegant yet without the air of pretentiousness 
that I had often felt from some of the other females as they walked past, noses upturned at the very idea of my existence. I wanted her, but that could come later. For now, my being was consumed with completing my first invention. Nothing would stop me from this. I turned back toward her. She had pulled her blouse over her exposed skin beneath and glared at me. What's your name? I asked with genuine interest. She turned her head away in mockery of my earlier movement. It's Staria, she said. Mine is Howard. I, I really want to see you again, but I can't do this. Not now and not like this. She turned back to me. Her green eyes caught the dim light and sparkled. I thought that within that look, beyond the purposeful mask of wrath, was a hint of admiration. All right, Howard. And how are you going to spend your free time? The way she said my name had a biting inflection to it. How about I show you? She shrugged but followed as I left my quarters and headed for the lobby of the theater. The lobby was the only other place that had a dispenser besides the cafeterias. I was almost running to get to it. Staria matched my pace, though without the same fervor. I plugged my identification card into the machine. The screen displayed a thousand credit balance. I scrolled down to the tablet, pressed the button, and finally it was there in my hands. I almost felt like holding it above my head and cheering in triumph. Instead, I simply transferred my data from the old device to the new one. The whole ordeal took about a minute, but it felt far longer. Once the information had been sent over to my new tablet, I opened the wondrous program that held my plans. I did a quick reformat of the sizing and gazed in awe and how much easier it was to see everything splayed out in glorious detail. I didn't even notice Staria peering past my shoulder. What's that? She asked, pointing to the diagrams and equations. It's my engine. My God, it's ingenious. I never could have imagined utilizing energy from gravity and magnetics in such an efficient way. I turned and looked into her emerald eyes with a newfound astonishment and amazement. You can tell how it works just by looking at my scrawling? I said. Of course. I may be just an accountant, but my ambition pushes toward the finer sciences of mathematics. The blueprints are gibberish to me, but the equations spell out the whole story. My lust for her morphed into something deeper. I had no idea what this feeling was, but it magnified past the superficial and into an unfamiliar realm. You have a few errors here and here, she said, pressing her index finger against the screen. But otherwise, it is flawless. I could help if you send me a copy. You, Staria, are the most exceptional woman that I have ever met. She grinned sheepishly. Maybe after work, we could work on it together, she said. I would like that very much, but wouldn't you rather spend your free time relaxing? No. I sent the equations to Staria's device and we split ways. I went into the theater and she went to the cafeteria to get breakfast. I ignored the visions projected on the screen and continued work on my engine, perfecting the drawings in detail that I had never been able to accomplish before. Gears, wires, and pistons manifested in their full intricacy. It was difficult to focus given my preoccupation with Staria, but it was also the driving factor that pushed me to achieve. Ten o'clock. Time to work. Ten o'clock. Time to work. I found myself actually hesitant with the rest of them. I just wanted to continue. The work was calling. I shuffled out with the hordes and entered the elevator. Atypically, Frank approached me. So how was it? He asked. 
How was what? I replied. That piece of ass from the accounting department. Did she screw the rigidity out of ya? Yeah, I guess she did, I said, lying to prevent further inquisition and to dissuade the almost certain disapproval. Hell yeah, brother. You up for another night of fun? I've got another girl for ya. Tits like watermelons. If you thought the girl last night was a banger, well, this one'll hump you dry. No, I'm not. Frank stared at me aghast. What do you mean, no? He implored. I mean, no. I'm not going. I have plans. Plans? What kind of plans could take priority over this kind of enjoyment? I... I have. I was hesitant to reveal my date with Staria, but the expectant face of Frank compelled me to speak. I knew that he wouldn't take no for an answer without a good excuse. Well, spit it out, he snarled. I have an engagement with Staria. Staria? Who the feck is Staria? he asked, with a complete lack of awareness. My tone became defiant and defensive. Staria is the woman you set me up with last night. She is the most incredible person that I have ever met. Howie, 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 he said, shaking his head. You can't just fall for the first woman you sleep with. Rookie mistake. Take a taste of the whole buffet before you choose your entree. I stifled the urge to punch him. Instead, my voice simply rose until I was screaming at him. She's not a meal. She is a human being with passion and ambition, unlike the rest of you troglodytes. You are so busy trying to get laid that you fail to see the person there before you. Is that really how you choose to live? One woman to the next, one drink to another? Last night you called us drones. I see now that you are a drone by choice. Whoa, Howard. Are you still drunk? What's gotten into ya? I pushed him away from me as gently as my rage would allow. Frank, thank you for the credits, but my debt has been repaid. Don't take this the wrong way, but I hope to never spend another instant of my free time with you and your cronies again. Again. Howard, he began, but didn't have a chance to finish. I turned away from him, and the lift came to a stop. I hastened out and entered my cubicle. Ten thirteen. Early as usual, employee nine four seven two. Feel free to take the remainder of your time to get comfortable. Sure, guess I will. I pulled out my tablet and continued work on the schematics. 1030, employee 9472. Time to initiate work procedure. Just give me another minute, I replied. Work procedure has been initiated. Further refusal to work will result in a demerit against employee 9472's work record. My confrontation with Frank had riled me up so much that I blatantly ignored the directive of the computer voice. Then give me a damn demerit. I'm busy here. Very well. Demerit recorded. Further demerits will be issued at ten-minute intervals, provided that employee 9472 continues non-compliance. I rebelliously set a timer for nine minutes and continued to draw the contours of my engine casing. When the timer rang, I closed the program and said, Ready to work. Play some literature. Sorry, employee 9472. Employees with a demerit are ineligible for audio during work hours. What? I shouted. It was more an angry outburst than a question. The computer repeated itself. Employees with a demerit are ineligible. I get that. You mean that lecherous dog gets to listen to his ridiculous tunes while I am condemned to silence? 
employee 4689 has displayed exemplary work ethic. Please begin work procedure. Wait, what do you mean employee 4689? Are you talking about Frank? Query unavailable. Begin work procedure. It's Frank, isn't it? Have you been spying on our conversations? Query unavailable. Begin work procedure. Screw your query unavailable. What else have you been listening in on? Are you watching everything that we do? 1040. Additional demerit recorded. Warning. Third demerit will result in further penalization. Up to and including termination. Begin work procedure. Fine. Fine. Just let me get to work. The monitor in front of me flickered into life, spelling out yet another day of drudgery. I stared at the line of biscuits in maddening silence and thought. I thought of the machine's words and the horrifying consequences of what it had insinuated. I pondered the governmental proceedings and what they meant for the future, a future devoid of adequate production by its drones. Frank had been right to call us such, but I still clung to the hope that this drone could surpass its programming. Above all, I fantasized about a life with Staria. We would work together to drag ourselves out of this pit devoid of intellect. There was no other way. Couldn't stand another day of our talents being wasted on such frivolous labor. We were meant for better, greater things. Twelve o'clock. Time for lunch. Twelve o'clock. Time for lunch. I moved out of my workspace one of the herd. We moved urgently for the elevator, as if our lives depended on it. I avoided Frank as the cage went down. I wandered through the gate and decided that a meal could do me good. I walked into the cafeteria and stood in line at the vending machine, thinking about what I wanted to eat. I was sure that I wouldn't have the credits for much, maybe a simple sandwich, but I felt that even such would be a grand meal for a conqueror as me. I had what I wanted. I could afford to splurge a bit. The line ended, and I inserted my card into the machine. I didn't even have the chance to scroll through the meals. The screen turned red and spat my card out. It displayed a message declaring that insubordinate employees were ineligible for meals. I snatched my identification back and slammed my fist against the screen. Pain racked my knuckles, but there was no sign of damage on the smooth surface of the vending machine. I ignored the onlookers. It was ironic that I had chosen not to eat before so that I could achieve, and now that I had reached the near precipice of that achievement, I was barred from eating. I found a seat alone and glared at anyone that dared to try and sit next to me. I found myself wishing that our eating arrangements were not segregated by gender. I longed for the company of Staria. I stood there by myself, without even realizing that the lottery winner had taken up position at the front of the room. It was only when he spoke that my consciousness diverted itself from its inner turmoil. I have the remote, and I get to choose today's media. While I would love to continue our viewing of the mystery of Miss Moriarty's Hollow, there is something of more import to see at the moment. The cafeteria erupted into booing. Come on! We want to see if Detective Morris can finally plumb the depths of Moriarty's Hollow! shouted someone in the crowd. Eh, yeah, give us more of the miss. I'm dying to see who will plow her next, yelled another with markedly less subtle verbiage. Friends, friends, said the man with the remote. I know. I too can't wait to see the next sexy misadventures of Miss Moriarty. But there is another program of the utmost importance. Bear with my choice, he said. The projector flicked on and displayed a live feed of the congressional hearing. The heading at the bottom read, Breaking News, Final Deliberations of the Workers' Protection Act Underway. 
The crowd went silent as representatives gave their closing statements. Fellow Americans, Today we sit at a crossroads that will determine the future of this country. The men laboring to keep our economy alive have cried out to us. Their words are not lost on us, their duly elected representatives. That grievance has come to us loud and clear. The average American does not have enough free time. They are not adequately granted time to relax, time to unwind, time to throw off the shackles of corporate oppression. Day after day, these brave men and women are relegated to work ridiculously long hours just to pay their bills. We, the proponents of the Workers' Protection Act, say that enough is enough. Let the workers have the free time that they have undeniably earned through their service to this country. Give them the rest they deserve. Another representative took the stand. His expression was one of desperation and pleading. We, as a nation, are facing economic collapse. The producers have ceased to produce. The innovators are gone, moving on to countries that are less restrictive. We are in debt up to our grandchildren's grandchildren's ears. Every company is subsidized, bailed out, nationalized. There is no freedom. No private property, no autonomy. The Lord himself gave us free will to act as we see fit. Why should the government be able to countermand that divine sentence? The Workers' Protection Act is a folly that only fools would support. Restriction upon an already choked economy is not the answer. There was a time when men wanted to work. They were driven to support themselves their families, a time when people believed that through the sweat on their brows and the effort of their labor, they could become kings, not of birthright, but of achievement. That was the American dream, but that dream died long ago. This so-called act is an act of beating a dead horse that has been rotting in the dirt for decades. The Speaker of the House interrupted him. Representative Paul, your time has elapsed. Now is the time to place your vote. No. For years you so-called representatives have ignored reality. We cannot exist without the individual who strives for something better, something more. I'll be damned if I sit idly by while this fetid mire pushes for more regulation. We're dying here. We're owned by foreign interests. And our currency means even less than it did when we had the dollar. We are slaves. Slaves not of other men, but of the government. No man should be constrained by the whim of the majority, and even less so the whims of power-mad tyrants. Give me liberty, or give me death! Representative Paul's words rose to a near-shrieking decibel. The speaker banged a gavel and screamed at a pitch and volume to match the representatives. Get him out of here! Two burly men pulled Paul out of the hearing as he continued the mantra. Give me liberty or give me death! Give me liberty or give me death! The final vote was cast. It was 462 I, 12 nay, and 1 abstained. The margin was not enough to send to the Senate, nearly unanimous. The Speaker made his declaration. The Workers' Protection Act is hereby passed, and will go into effect tomorrow, barring a presidential veto. Working hours are reduced to a maximum of two hours, with payment remaining at current standards. Nearly all of the men in the cafeteria who had been staring at the congressional hearing with rapt attentiveness, broke loose into a chaotic maelstrom of hooting and cheering, clapping and shouting. Frank came up to my seated position, seemingly ignorant of our previous encounter. By God, Howie, they did it. The crazy bastards finally did it. We are nearly free. Whoever said that democracy don't work? 
I stood up to face him. Did you even hear what the opposition said? America is falling apart. Do our credits even mean anything? What do you mean? That guy was probably just a corporate shill. Of course credits mean something. You bought that damn tablet with him, didn't ya? Our country is great. Even better now that they passed the Workers' Protection Act. Took them long enough. What about the debt? Foreign interests? The American dream? Frank, don't you want anything other than more free time? American dream? Howard, the American dream is happening right now. Soon the rich will pay what they owe to us. We built their wealth. You want to talk about debt? What about the debt to us? What about what they owe us? I hope the feds don't stop until every ounce of labor has been repaid. Justice will not have been served till all our time is free time, and all our free time is paid by the gold hoarders up top. The drones have been heard, Howie. The drones are heard. Don't you call me Howie, you stagnant, fetid turd. You, you are the problem with this country. You may call these men and women representatives, but they don't represent me. I'm human. You're just an animal in a gilded cage. Enjoy your free time. I didn't allow Frank to respond. I walked away and exited the cafeteria. The only other place I was allowed was the restroom. I sat in the stall and pulled my tablet out. Paranoia insisted I pull my pants down to my ankles, completing the illusion. I sat there on the toilet. I had finished the diagrams, so I worked on the equations. My goal was completion of the project, but a rogue thought desired impressing Staria. I fumbled through the mathematics until the telltale robotic voice called out, Three o'clock. Time to work. Three o'clock. Time to work. My mind told me not to go, told me to continue fighting to force my work forward, but my legs moved with the rhythm of practiced obedience. I, with the typical slumped figure of a man without meaning, shuffled toward the elevator. My manner shifted to match those condemned to obscurity. My hope was still alive but it was hindered by the words of Representative Paul. I was beginning to believe that maybe my effort was for naught. Maybe there really were no innovators. Yet still I clung to hope. I clung to faith that my effort was worth something. I clung to the belief that my engine would earn me a fortune and that our superiors would finally recognize me as the asset that I was. I entered my cubicle. The computer voice stated, Perfect timing, employee 9472. Records show demerits issued. Media disabled. Initiate work procedure. I begrudgingly initiated work procedure, but worked just as hard as usual. My thoughts, however, hung on other things. My mind fought against mathematics that lingered just beyond the scope of my knowledge. I cursed myself for not listening to some books on calculus while I still had the privilege. It became almost a necessity to utilize Staria's knowledge. I knew my engine would work, but I had to be able to prove it without there being a shred of doubt. My painstaking puzzling over the numbers came to a halt with a wave of joy as the machine voice said, Five o'clock. Work is over. Free time. I almost ran to the elevator, eager to see Staria and eager to finish the schematics. The damn mechanism that lifted the elevator seemed to be running at an agonizingly slow speed. Finally, I felt the same impatience as the other workers that were crowded around me. Not an urgency for free time as those imbeciles but the kind of anxiety that comes from desiring expedience towards the culmination of work 
finally reaching its ultimate crux. When the gate clanged open, I rushed out. I waited in the lobby for Staria, but she didn't show. I recognized some of the accountant girls from the other night, so I approached them and asked, Hey, have you seen Staria? They looked at each other with stupidity stamped on their faces like brands burned into the rears of cattle. Who? asked one of the women. She had dark skin and a look of superiority. It was the same appearance that I had thought of as the antithesis of Staria's when I had gazed upon her this morning. Staria, she works in the accounting department with you? I stated. I don't know anyone named Staria. She was here last night with us. She and I left to go to my quarters. I blushed involuntarily at the implications of that last sentence. Oh, her. We'd never met her before last night. She doesn't work with us. I don't even remember her name. But it sure as hell wasn't Staria. What? But... The woman interrupted me. Girls! Any of you remember that harlot's name? Lover boy here wants another round. She spoke brazenly, as if they weren't guilty of the same kind of sordidness that she had accused Daria of. My face flushed again. This time it wasn't from embarrassment, but of anger. I think she said it was k something. Kathy? replied another. Ah, that's right. Catherine, said she worked in quality assurance. I work in quality assurance, I said. Well, then what the hell are you asking me for? She shouted. Get out of my face, you dirty poon hound. I followed her obscene directive, not out of obedience, but to prevent myself from slapping her face. I found that, while her statement contributed heavily to my anger, her words were not the origin. Staria, or Catherine, or whatever her real name was, had lied to me. My head spun, though, with the question of motive. Why had she lied? What was her game, and, if it was indeed a game, why didn't she show up here to play more? Part of an answer was delivered unsatisfactorily, through unwelcome means. Yeah said Frank as he sauntered up to me. He handed me a small slip of paper. It was wrinkled to the point of nearly feeling soft to the touch and folded in half. I opened it without even glancing up to meet Frank's gaze. Upon it were handwritten equations to correct the flawed ones in my blueprint. Where did you get this? I asked with a tinge of desperation. Some guy just handed it to me and asked me to give it to you. Not gonna lie, Howard. I had half the mind to just toss it in the bin. But I figured I owed you something for giving you that nice bruise on the jaw. Who gave it to you? The volume of my voice rose. I dunno. I didn't get a good look at him. I pocketed the note and grabbed his pudgy shoulders with both hands. Frank, damn it! I need to know who gave you this paper! I shook him as I yelled. He shoved me and I fell onto the concrete floor with the wind and words knocked out of me. Criminy! The feck is wrong with you! He walked away, shaking his head, leaving me sprawled on the floor. I didn't even bother to stand up, even with people staring and whispering around me. I pulled out my tablet, removed the note, and plugged in the corrections. I laughed in gleeful triumph. I must have seemed deranged, but I didn't care. It was finished, finally done, ready to propel me out of this backwards pit of sewage and human garbage, this putrid hole of zombified animals that had no ambition other than the next decadent meal. The next episode of the mystery of Miss Moriarty's Hollow. The next bout of useless free time. I stood up and went to my quarters. Nine o'clock. Time to wake. Nine o'clock. Time to wake. 
I had almost forgotten that our work hours had been slashed in half. I headed to the cafeteria to eat. Fortunately, the machine no longer gave me a message about insubordinate employees. I chose a simple meal of eggs and toast. It was all I could afford. Watery scrambled eggs soaked in already soggy slice of compressed bread. I walked to the most secluded table possible and sat down. As I put the food in my mouth, I noticed something strange about the flavor. It barely tasted differently than the pill, which was odd considering I had just swallowed that capsule without any regard to the taste. It was almost like the foods were basic rations with an additive making it taste somewhat like the item described. I thought back with clarity to the numerous meals I had consumed throughout my years of working here. Each one had been marred by that same bland artificial quality. I had just never noticed before. Regardless, hunger compelled me to continue my meager feast. After finishing, I wondered what to do. I sat there looking over my engine plans, but found nothing to improve. I was at a loss. What more could I do? Then the realization struck me. Why not go further? That was my future anyway. Why not work on more? I opened a new document on my tablet, and images took hold, seemingly of their own accord. A new idea formed, based on the work I had already done. A generator that could create power off of the natural forces around us. Wind, solar, and hydroelectric power would become obsolete. I could devise a way to generate electricity from a combination of gravity, magnetics, atmospheric pressure, and even the residual static charge in the air. I started the plans. I even envisioned a way to combine the engine with the generator so that neither would require fuel of any sort. I stopped. I was getting ahead of myself. I didn't even know how I was going to present my engine to the higher-ups. I had never met them, and there was no conceivable way to get in touch with them. Down here, Everything was automated to remove the need for managerial contact. The fringes of despair began to erode at my hope. How would I ever meet with the bosses if I had no means to? Despair told me I had wasted my time. I was better off just existing in a state devoid of thinking, like the rest of the drones. It said I could be content to devolve into the nature of base pleasures food, intoxication, and sex. I shoved away the idea. I had worked hard to formulate this engine. I accomplished that much, and I could accomplish recognition. Existence of the kind prevailing here was not living. I refused to accept that my lot in life was to wallow in stagnancy with the rest. Eleven o'clock. Time to work. Eleven o'clock. Time to work. My metaphysical quandary was cut short by the announcement of work. Where before I had enjoyed productivity, I now found it distasteful. My enjoyment had finally been drained by striving for something better. My work ethic remained the same, but it felt like effort toward naught. The elevator stuttered and churned, like a dying beast. It fulfilled its purpose, and we arrived at our destination, but I was certain it was on its last legs. I entered my cubicle and sat at the desk. 11.23, employee 9472. Adequate, but slightly early. Whatever. Am I allowed to listen to media again? Absolutely, employee 9472. A happy employee is a productive employee. Fantastic. I choose literature. Option unavailable. Music or commentary. I groaned at the repeated denial of choice. Ah. Well, play some music then. Genre? I don't know. Lazy tits, I guess. Genre unavailable. Unavailable? 
Is there any reason why? No latest hits are available. I wondered if this was some kind of glitch, but the possible ramification of the computer's statement wiggled its way into my mind as I thought of Representative Paul's words. The producers have ceased to produce. Maybe there weren't any latest hits to play. Okay, play something classical. The speaker in my cubicle played some orchestral number that I was unfamiliar with. I got to work surveying the passing objects. Everything went as normal until I saw something I had seen before. It was like deja vu, except I knew for certain I had experienced the repetition. On the conveyor belt was a malformed biscuit. It was shaped like a peach with a white spot in the center. My first reaction was to assume a mechanical malfunction had caused the same deformation, but as I watched the puck pass off the side of my screen, I knew it was the same sad wrinkled mess I had reported just two days before. Computer? I asked. The music stopped. Yes. What the hell is this? Please clarify query. What am I doing here? Work procedure. I narrowed my eyes, although there was no one to see my look of suspicion. I just saw the exact same biscuit as I did a couple of days ago. What am I doing here? Employee 9472's job description is as follows. Observe product for irregularity. Report on product irregularity. Insert report through file shoot. Why did I see the same product irregularity as I did before? What is going on here? Please file report. You're not answering me. Uh, reinitiate work procedure or a demerit will be issued against employee 9472's work record. The epiphany hit my head like a brick off a skyscraper. Computers don't hesitate, nor do they use filler words. Who are you? I am the automated employee assistant. Don't play dumb with me. Who the hell are you? Please, man. I'm just trying to do my job. I don't want to get terminated. The answer was enough for me. I stood from my recliner and put my fist through the monitor. Shards of glass and fragments of circuitry scattered across the desk. My knuckles bled. Whoa! What are you doing? shouted the voice through the electronic filter. The facade of technologic origin was broken as the usually calm and robotic syntax broke into fear and emotion. I jumped onto the desk and grabbed at the speaker. Hey, man! Don't do this. I pulled at the box with all the effort I can muster. Come on, dude. Calm down. It broke free with a shower of sparks, and I let it fall onto the remnants of my screen. Two men burst into the cubicle and grabbed me from off the desk. They tackled me to the ground as I thrashed about. They tied my hands behind my back and blindfolded me. They dragged me out. My hands were untied as I was pulled up to a standing position. When the covering was finally lifted from my eyes, I was standing at the foot of a long table. Men sat on either side, silent and stoic. At the head of the table, in a massive chair that looked like a corporate throne, was Staria. I was stunned into silence. The woman I had known as Staria took the reins of conversation. Welcome, Howard. She stretched out her arms in a graceful arc, as though she were showing me some kind of mystical new fantasy world. I found myself unimpressed. Who are you? We are the board of directors. No, who are you? You, Staria, not these faceless men. They are of no concern to me, of no consequence. Where do you fall? Who are you, really? I am the CEO. Why am I here? Beyond 
company property damage, increasing insubordinates, and a general disturbance of your co-workers? You are here because I wished it. A cut to the chase. I want that engine. For what? To send the same mystery biscuits down a conveyor faster? What does this company even produce? We provide security, safety, contentedness. All of the things vital to the upkeep of a civilized society. Who are you, Howard, to question what we provide? You yourself are a beneficiary of our altruistic endeavors. The engine is not for my own selfish motives. That thing you somehow managed to concoct in your feeble little mind could end the energy crisis once and for all. Don't you want to help people? Help? Help them do what? These people here are little more than mindless animals. They don't achieve. They have no drive, no ambition. Whatever happens to the American dream? It is dead and buried where it belongs. Men are animals. If it weren't for us, they would fight and kill each other over scraps of food, as they did in the days when we lived in caves, and as they continue to do out there. We are society. We are peace, and we are the fabric that ties mankind together. Without order, there is chaos. Without government, there is treacherous savagery and anarchy. The days of greed are behind us. So, you are government? Of course. There isn't a legitimate business entity left that isn't federally owned. But enough of this idle chatter. Surrender your tablet. What happens when I do? Will I be allowed to invent more? Why would you want to do that? Wouldn't you be happier to spend the rest of your days indulging in the free time we allow you? No! I shouted. I just want to create. You said yourself that my engine will solve the energy crisis. I could solve any number of problems. All that I want is fair compensation. What a selfish motive. What of your co-workers? Are they to live as they do, while you get to live a decadent, immoral life? Doesn't sound fair to me. Now give me the tablet. No, it's mine. I worked hard to earn it, and even more so to come up with the ideas that are in it. You can't have it. Yours, eh? Don't you understand? You don't even own yourself. You, your tablet, and even the contents of your mind belong to the United States of America. If you don't give it to us, we will take what is ours by right and use whatever force is necessary to retain that right. I started to laugh. It was a laugh of despair and a laugh of triumph. If only those fools had kept my hands restrained. I pulled the tablet from my pocket and smashed it over my knee. The CEO started to clap slowly, and the men around the table added their own hands to the smattering of sarcastic applause. She signaled for them to stop, and the room went silent. Brava, Howard. You forget that you transferred a copy of the plans to my device. It must have felt good, thinking that you had outsmarted us. Instead, all that you accomplished was to make a mockery of yourself. My lips curled up into a smirk. Check again, Staria. You have numbers and symbols. But the heart of the engine was on that tablet and is in my mind. Her face turned red and she stuttered in rage. I, I can f find someone else to con c complete it. Where? The half-witted slaves? I have it on good authority that they won't work more than two hours a day. It took me years to draw those designs. Do you think the power grid can last that long? She calmed herself. 
flattened the folds of her suit jacket, and pressed a button on the table. Employee 9472, you are hereby terminated, effective immediately. Go. Go and live with the degenerates on the street. Maybe then you will learn that we are the safeguard from the evils of humankind. Frankly, I hope you die in some godforsaken hole, with the memory of the security we provided as your only comfort. She swiveled her chair away, so all I could see was the leather backing. The two men from before came through the doors behind me. They grabbed my arms and ripped me away from the table without the bother of blindfold or restraint. I laughed the whole way out. My chuckles faded into subdued giggling when they pulled me into a dark elevator. Even in the small confines, they refused to loosen their grip. When the elevator struggled to a difficult stop, the men chucked me through the open doors. I found myself outside and laying on a pockmarked stretch of asphalt staring up at a sign that read, Flaherty Industries, above the door. The sun was setting over the rooftops of dilapidated crumbling buildings. It smeared shades of pink and violet over the white clouds. Hello there! shouted someone from an alley that was beyond my vision. An old man with a big gray beard walked over to me and helped me to my feet. He was disheveled and looked just as broken down as the structures around us, but there was a gleam in his eyes telling of a vigor unbroken by age. Come, come, he beckoned. I've got a fire over here that you can sit by and warm yourself up, free of charge. I felt the air begin to chill in the waning light, so I followed his waddling to a ramshackle set of buckets and cinder blocks encircling the glowing orange flames of a carefully crafted cement ring. Take a seat. It has been a while since anyone came out of that business, he scoffed as he motioned to the makeshift chairs. I squatted onto one of the buckets, and the old man plopped on a pile of blocks with a groan from the discomfort of years in his joints. I put my hands close to the flames to thaw the progressive numbing of my fingertips. I gazed into the fire and watched it chaotically lick at the air, fueled by cracked timbers. So what's your name, stranger? He said, while placing a rusty kettle near the base of the fire. I'm Howard. Great to meet you, Howard. My name is Donovan Flaherty. I looked up at the sign and grinned a bit. Awful coincidence, Mr. Flaherty. Your name being on that building I was just ejected from. Coincidence? No, that building was mine. Built it from the ground up with the earnings I managed to scrape together by working in a warehouse. Really, you... No offense, old man, but you don't look like the business type, I said, thinking of the manipulative CEO and her attempted subterfuge and theft of my blueprints. No offense at all. I guess I wasn't. Otherwise, I would still be up in that tower. No, I wanted to do something great, even if my greatness was just a tiny star in the vast universe of greatness. I wouldn't give that up to anyone. Eventually, the board of directors got fed up and got rid of me. I just refused to follow their damned regulations. What did your business do? What greatness did you provide to the world, despite the hampering, by I assume, government intervention? Intervention? It was more than intervention. They took everything. Every cent that I had put into Flaherty Industries was stolen from me. The man you see here by the light of this fire is a man that has been mugged and exiled, not by the vagabond, but by the holders of the law itself. That's terrible, but you didn't mention what your business did. Oh, didn't I? I guess not. My company was the premier suppliers of dog treats in the United States. Dog treats? Are you serious? I was examining dog treats? Probably. 
but it's been a long time since anything came out of that factory besides you. People nowadays have little need for pets. Dogs are food now. Why the hell was I in there, then? Donovan shrugged. Being comfortable is a marketable commodity, given the alternative. But at what cost? Our freedom? Is that really a fair transaction? To some people, it is. They don't want to have to fight for survival, to grow as humans, to make something greater than themselves. Given the responsibility of liberty, many choose to cast the responsibility off and enjoy not having to think or do anything significant. They just want to exist, without the ramifications that come with simply being. I don't want to be a slave. And that's why you're out here instead of being in there. Take this fire. It's a beautiful thing, free and full of energy. With it, men can generate warmth, creation, steel, mechanisms, any number of wonders. But left unrestrained, given all the fuel it needs, it can destroy nearly everything. We are fire. We are the creation that comes from the careful placement of stone around our ambition. The stone is necessary, but pile up too much, and it stifles the flame. Doesn't take many stones. Just look before you. Controlled, but powerful. Warmth, food, and coffee. He pointed to the kettle. It does what it was meant to. I looked around at the destroyed homes and businesses. I looked at the building of Flaherty Industries and thought of the masses of people that lived just to satisfy their animalistic desires. Should we stop the flames? Absolutely, but it is easy to manage the fire of oneself. What is much harder is to keep yourself from stifling another's flame. Never let your fire burn out someone else. I understood his message even flooded as it was with metaphor. I knew what I had to do, even if it set me back years of relentless effort. Donovan, do you have any paper and something to write with? Why, yes. What do you have to offer in exchange? I looked at my person and realized that I had nothing. I don't have anything but the clothes on my back. What size are those boots? I pulled them off and handed them to Donovan. He slid off his worn, dirty, and frayed shoes. They could barely even be called footwear. He pulled on my boots and laced them closed. I pushed my feet toward the fire to alleviate the newfound cold. Mr. Flaherty shuffled through a soggy cardboard box and produced a smattering of moldy paper and a pen. He shoved these items toward me and smiled from beyond the gray strands of his unkempt beard. Your first transaction from beyond the unreality. Welcome to the real world, Howard. I hope you can make more of it than I have. Feel free to get some sleep here. There aren't many safe places left to get a decent rest nowadays. No worries, I won't charge you rent for an alley. Thank you. I half expected to find myself stripped of all of my clothes when I woke, but as the sun rose, I found myself fully clothed minus the boots that I had traded away. The morning sun brought warmth and color to the world. The world was gray and drab, but full of opportunity. Flaherty, the grizzled old hobo, lay sleeping on a strip of cardboard. I walked over the deserted street full of holes and empty promises. I moved toward the rays of orange and yellow rising over the ruins. I pulled out the paper and pen and started to write. The diagrams of my engine were still fresh in my mind, and the equations that I had struggled over were even more so imprinted on my memory. I scribbled out a few preliminary sketches and dreamed of scrap dealers. Perhaps I could sell my knowledge of physics and mechanical engineering for the components I needed. I had no idea how I was to survive. I had subsisted on the scraps that government allowed us, but despite this I felt something new. 
it was similar to what I had felt from the idea of Staria before she had revealed her nefarious schemes, but different in its underlying source. It was the feeling of warmth, like that from the flame. I was cast into a new realm of danger and chaos, but at least I was free.